Hey, Chad Peterman here. We are absolutely loving our partnership with Smart AC here on the podcast. When it comes to streamlining your membership program, they are who to call. In case you missed the first episode, here's a replay. The industry is growing. So you're either going to let more people come into it and compete with you, or you're going to get better at what you do and service more people without adding to the overhead. Chad Peterman here, and you are listening to Can't Stop the Growth, a platform for leaders and teams to grow and thrive. We highlight the importance of personal development, pursuing greatness, and always chasing your potential. Let's get into it. Hello and welcome to another episode of Can't Stop the Growth. I'm your host, Chad Peterman, and today I have two very special guests that are going to help us understand what is to come in the future. 2023 has been a little bit of a grind for everybody in the home services space, and I think it's important to understand, you know, maybe what we're not paying attention to. And as these two guests will share, you know, are we as companies leveraging technology that can make us more efficient? and deliver better service to our customers. So without further ado, want to welcome to the show from Smart AC, CEO Josh Tickle and COO Andy Fusile. Welcome to the show, guys. Thanks, Chad. Appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Yeah, absolutely. Excited to talk about not only your guys' product, but also preview things for 2024 and the partnership we're going to have with Smart AC moving through next year, some of kind of the exciting things that we're going to be providing listeners with, and kind of the insights from your guys' seat, working with some of the top home services contractors in the space, you know, what you're seeing from a leadership perspective, what you're seeing from kind of an adoption of technology, and how people are running their businesses, and how people are looking out into the future to try to get ahead. So with that, Maybe you guys could give a little bit of your background. I've heard the story. I think you guys bring a lot of great insights into the industry itself. But uh, Josh, you want to start us off kind of with your background and then Andy, maybe follow up with that. And then Josh, maybe give us an overview of what Smart AC. I'm sure people have heard of it, floated out there. You've been on a number of different podcasts and things of that nature. But just to give the listeners a little bit of background on where we're coming from. Yeah, sure. So my background is engineering originally but really entrepreneurship and kind of selling to homeowners space. And so built my first company in the home improvement space, not in the trades, but kind of like to say that I learned how to whisper to homeowners in that business and kind of building backyard makeovers across Texas. And then had the opportunity to kind of foray it into technology, which is where I wanted to be with a technical background at smartyc.com. So my passion is really around homeowner experience, the psychology of selling to homeowners and how that interaction in the home how you go about that strategically can make or break the growth of home services business. Yeah. So um, similar to Josh, uh, mechanical engineering background, did a couple stints at some larger organizations, worked at GE, worked at Schneider Electric, pulled a lot of great things out of those big companies and what you know importance about process and communication and standardization. Where I really found a passion was inside of Schneider. I got an opportunity to, to do kind of a mini startup, taking what we already knew how to do, but do a different industry. And during that process, I really just fell in love with the whole concept really the commercialization, taking something from idea all the way through finished product and then building a group of people around it, bring it to market. And since then, that's what I've done at now four different companies. And so that's kind of grown into my passion is that commercialization process, process optimization around building the company. And then, and I love pouring my time into the people aspect of building the companies. And so as we're building value, it's building it for individuals and not just faceless organization. So that's really been my passion. Yeah, absolutely. I think that what you said, Josh and and Andy as well, is kind of speaking to the homeowner. I think that that's going to be an extremely important piece of the puzzle here moving into 2024. You know, all the intel that we can see about predicting the future says that, you know, people are going to be maybe spending less, opting for maybe repairs over replacements, different things like that. Tell us a little bit about, obviously, Smart AC, a very dare to call it kind of revolutionary, but I think it's more so just getting into that home service space and looking at things that we already do as consumers, but looking at it from that space. So maybe Josh, if you can give us a little bit of background on, you know, what is Smart AC? How does it better speak to where customers are at this day and age? Yeah, for sure. So so everything we do at smartac.com is to focus on 
really memberships at the end of the day. So when we studied the industry four, four and a half years ago, it became very evident that companies knew how to spend money on advertising, get in front of the homeowner and sell them. And but what we saw was one of the main KPIs of their membership programs was the adoption rate. And it was like 20 percent industry wide. And so I like to say at SmartAC.com, we, we really focused on three main KPIs, all of which revolve around memberships, agreements, you know, the methodology that the industry uses to acquire and retain that relationship. And so the first one is just that acquiring that membership. A lot of people don't like to prepay for things they're not sure that they need. And so for decades, we've been asking homeowners to do just that. They pay to come out to the house a couple of times a year, just, you know, in case, in case something's needed. And of course, that is the right thing to do for the equipment, but it is a hard sell and has been for a long time. And so the first thing we wanted to do was just be able to give the customer value 365 days a year. So it becomes more of a no brainer that establishing that relationship with a contractor is the right thing to do. So that's the first KPI. And the second KPI is just making sure that once we get them on an ongoing relationship, we retain them. Churn rates can be very high, especially when homeowners are kind of signing up for the wrong reasons, you know, maybe for what they get day one instead of ongoing benefit. And so we try to structure our platform around that, around getting a homeowner to be able to have that relationship long term. And then we want to convert them into a big ticket item. So that's the why we built the platform. The what it is, is really customizing the experience for the homeowner and the way they take care of their HVAC and plumbing equipment with strategic sensors deployed in the house to understand the health of that equipment. And so I'll spare the details, but, you know, a five minute setup of a couple of sensors in supply and return air and evaporator drain pan, among other places, allows the contractor to be able to give the homeowner proactive solutions hopefully before they even lose comfort and allows the homeowner to kind of be in the loop the entire way and take care of some of the annoying things that they have to take care of, like filters and, you know, water detection and communication with the contractor. So it's really just kind of a contractor white labeled solution effectively for an ongoing relationship via sensors and software with the homeowner. Yeah, I think that's an important point is I've done my research on this particular product and working to deploy it here at our company. I think it's just what you said. It's, you know, for years and years, we've said a membership and we know as contractors the value in it. But at the end of the day, we're only providing value basically two hours out of every year when we go out to visit. So how do we, you know, provide value all throughout the year where customers get that value every day of the year? And it's even so much as, you know, just that peace of mind that you pay for that you know that you can call somebody or somebody's looking after your stuff. And it's really a thing that you don't want to look after or don't want to have to. That's why you pay the professional. Andy, I guess for you, you know, you guys develop this product. You decide to get in the home service industry, really tackling this. What are some of the maybe trends and changes that you're seeing in the industry that make this product kind of a good fit for contractors to maybe think about as we're going into a new year, you know, the world changes so fast in today's day and age. What are some of those things that you're seeing from your seat that people should be thinking about as we move into a new year here? Yeah. So it, that's been actually super interesting on our side, because like you said, we were kind of new to the home services industry five years ago when we started this journey. And at the time, you know, Facebook was still reliable as a leads engine and contractors were being very successful doing the things they'd done for a long time. And there hadn't been, I'd say, any big breakthroughs. And so we were looking to be that next big breakthrough. But in the midst of us learning the industry and as Josh said, realizing the KPIs that drive the business and what we could do with our product, a lot of other change happened with the pandemic and the PE roll ups. So we've been part of just, I'd say, a huge sweeping change that the industry as a whole has seen, focusing a little bit. Marketing has been one of those, you know, big time. Facebook has completely changed from being this most reliable thing where leads aren't that way anymore. And then not only that, the PE dollars in the industry are now really, really driving up the cost of leads, putting a lot of pressure on some of those mid-sized, smaller contractors that didn't get swept up in those PE groups, maybe don't have the marketing dollars to spend. And even the bigger groups, we hear a lot. I personally hear a lot. I, I usually work with a lot of the enterprise customers for us in defining the metrics pre-rollout of, of the smartac.com platform. And, and what they're telling me is they're spending more on marketing than they ever have, and they're getting less as a return of it. And so they're, they're scrambling for ways to change the way to continue to get into homes. Not only that, another aspect of that PE influence is all of a sudden, everybody really had to get tight with their accounting practices. 
And so some of the aspects of accounting that were maybe a little bit ignored in the past are now very much in focus. Several reasons for that. But that has been a key influence for us as well, because when you do clean up all the accounting practices, what a lot of people have found is that having these membership plans in place where you don't go can actually be harmful for your business due to aspects of deferred revenue and stuff that I don't want to bore everybody with. So through the process of this PE influence, our product has become even more useful in ways we didn't even imagine. And so those are two that immediately jump out of me as ways that we have seen the trends change over the last, you know, kind of three or four years. You mentioned it earlier, Chad, too, that people are changing the way they want to interact with you as a contractor, right? I mean, it used to be pretty normal to pick up the phone and call them, but now people want that 30 second interaction via your website or an app, as opposed to having to pick up the phone and make that phone call. And so meeting them where they are, both in the way where you're advertising to them and also the way that they want to engage with you on a day one, you know, interaction or ongoing is something we've seen change a lot of the last five years as well, for sure. Just on that, Josh, that's a great point. We are seeing unprecedented reach out from the customer to the contractor through our platform. That has never happened before because of the, the reduced friction associated with it. When you can, when in your hand in seconds, you can be in a communication with somebody that's helping to solve a problem or even answer a question that you might've had in that moment while you're watching a football game. You're not gonna make the phone call to do it, but you're like, hey, I'll chat them real quick and say, hey, is my plumbing visit coming up? It is just unbelievable what we've seen with what the platform's allowed. Yeah, I think you guys are spot on. I mean, I have some real data. The last time I checked, which was probably a month ago, we're booking right now 30% of all calls we never actually speak to the customer. They're either booking themselves online or they're chatting or they're texting or whatever it is. We never actually have a phone conversation with that particular customer. So I think to your point, meeting the customer where they are, just because you like to pick up the phone doesn't mean your customer does. You know, I was just telling somebody the other day, like if Apple Pay wasn't a thing, I would have far less stuff. It just makes it so simple to do it. Like I've even not made purchases because they don't have Apple Pay and I'm too lazy to go walk upstairs and grab my wallet to punch in my credit card number. So I think that's interesting. And I think Smart AC, and you guys have touched on it, but Josh, I guess I'd ask you, you know, with your involvement with some of the top players in our space, why is your technology so important for industry leaders to be considering? Why is this something that, we should be looking at seriously and thinking about how can we implement this in our business? How does it provide better service? What's your thoughts on that? Yeah. So I think it does come back to those KPIs I mentioned earlier, but in addition to that, above and beyond just the membership side of the business and how we help our partners with those aspects, I would say it's really the biggest restriction these companies have for growth is talent in the field, right? Train staff. And you know that very well, Chad, with the training organization that you have. And so really what we are trying to encourage our partners to think about is how can they uncouple the growth of their customer base from the growth of the requirement to have more techs and train techs in the field, trucks, gas, things like that. There are lots of ways that our product can be used above and beyond memberships. And it's early in some of those new methods outside of memberships, but to be able to acquire a relationship with the customer and then hold that relationship without having to generate two non-demand calls a year. You know, when you look at the actual metrics, oh, actually, when our partners do the analysis and service Titan, it's very clear that non-demand calls are, you, you start from behind, right? By definition. And so you have a cost. Generally, what you price the plan at isn't covering that cost. And so we're just trying to come up with methodologies, new methodologies with each individual customer because different people want to do it different ways, of course, utilizing technology to put themselves in higher percentage opportunities more often and to utilize technology to make sure that you're driving those angles in the numbers game. And like I said before, the, the biggest thing is just how many homes under management do you have? Because you can certainly prompt somebody to replace that system or, or that plumbing equipment faster, but the biggest driver is just that eventually these things need to be replaced. And so the more homes that you have that look at you as their company of record for HVAC and plumbing, the better the bottom line of the business will be, of course. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, we did this study as well. Uh, and I would urge any home services people that, okay, well, I'm thinking about this is interesting. One thing I'd recommend you to do before you talk to these guys, and I would recommend talking to these guys, is run a report 
probably Service Titan. They're with most people. Run a report on all your $0 maintenance visits. And once you run a report on that, then take into account the labor, the gas, the truck, and then the insurance for the truck and for the person, all the other fringe benefits that you pay them. And when we talk about scaling, and Josh, you brought it up, it's a labor game, right? Well, if we're having trouble finding labor, if you know it takes a while to train somebody, can we provide value to a customer in a way that we don't have to fulfill or supply labor and maybe even provide them a better value with a technology that can monitor their system 365 days a year? We can't monitor it 365 days a year by going out twice a year. It's just not possible. I'll add one report to that. It's my favorite one that our partners pull, and it's how many homes that you have in a membership buy from you more than once a year. So when I talk to these organizations, the salespeople are the first people to speak up and say, hey, this is how we make money. We get in front of homeowners and totally understand that. But of course, it's a numbers game and you have to look at start with the numbers. And so Miss Jones doesn't really want to be sold to twice a year. Like that's a virtual certainty, especially if she didn't call you out for that demand call. And so saying no to IEQ four times every two years is, is a rough proposition. And so in general, I think you have to be looking at working backwards from the way the homeowner wants to interact with you and then looking at the numbers and saying, how often are these profitable and how often are they not? Eventually, the sales leaders kind of wrap their head around, I'd rather have twice as many homes that I see maybe once a year as opposed to having half as many that I'm at trying to sell to twice a year. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I think, too, we talked about it earlier from a standpoint of people want fast communication. They want frictionless service. Well, think about how hard it is. And I'm speaking to contractors. Think about all the memberships that you call multiple times to try to get something that they've already paid for scheduled because people are busy. I mean, heck, I'm as guilty as, you know, I built a new house and or moved in in 2021. I don't think I've had my equipment serviced once. I could easily walk down to someone and have it booked, but I'm like, well, then I got to figure out I'm not home. My wife's working. Like, how am I going to get there? I guess I could give them the code to my door. Like, you know, it's not probably as hard as I'm making it, but it's still one of those things that it's like, it'll be fine. But to your point, if I knew that it was being monitored and it was working fine, well, then I don't need to really have someone out. I mean, yes, I probably should. And this is probably not a good sales pitch for my business, but everyone is busy doing tons of different stuff. And I think that that's something to definitely consider as we're talking through this. I guess, Andy, from your perspective, having worked in a number of big industries and big companies and different stuff like that, what are you seeing into the future that are changes, maybe not even in the home service space, but just in general? We've talked a little bit about, you know, being frictionless, doing things of that nature. What are the other things that the people, and maybe not even related to your product, but that people should be considering as we move into 2024 and some of the things that are going on, maybe from a macro level and, and different things like that that you're seeing? I think one of the things, it's, it's really, it's a buzzword everywhere right now, and that's AI, right? It's data. But it's absolutely true what you can do when you understand the power of data and you put it to work. That's in, across any industry. Home services are definitely one to be slower to adopt things like that. But I mean, we're seeing all sorts of industries just absolutely completely change the way that we live our lives with the use of data. And it's a win for both sides. The customer gets a more convenient experience. Like you, you talked about shopping earlier, the number of things that get suggested to me of things I might like to buy that's accurate is phenomenal, right? And I actually appreciate that. It helps because I never go to the store. I never go to the grocery store unless I absolutely have to. But the other side of that are companies that are making money off that data optimization. We cannot lose that as we look at the home services industry. Is That has to be the next big wave of how you can do that. Optimization is good no matter what, right? Especially when you talk about the use and the percentage of people-driven aspects of home services versus not. Ways to balance that, I think, is, you know, we would be foolish in this industry not to do it when everyone else in the world is clamoring to do it, right? More money has gone into AI-based startups across the globe than has any other industry over the past like two years, because that's where everyone realizes the future is, right? No matter how you use it and what you do with the data. Macro, you ask about macro, I think that's where the next major, you know, call it revolution of industry is headed for us as data and data use. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's one thing too for and to get really clear with listeners that 
for so long. I've been hearing this since we've got in that, you know, Amazon's going to take over the home services and we shouldn't look into this. It's like, well, instead of being fearful, why don't we just kind of look at what they're doing and adopt some of those things? Yes, we are probably always going to need someone to go out and diagnose the problem. They're going to have to put their eyes on it. They're going to have to look at it. And I don't see robots here in the near future, you know, installing an HVAC system. So there's still going to be pieces of it. But to your point, the data is incredible and what it can do and the AI type stuff that can answer phone calls, talk to customers and different things like that, that again, it's not like you need to go fire half your people, right? You're still going to need your people, but can AI allow them to focus on things that can provide more value to the customer. Yeah, you could break point about but not firing people. The industry as a whole is growing, right? Like, I don't have the exact figure, but I think it's around 10% compounding the growth rate for the AC industry and projected for the next you know, five plus years. So like the industry is growing. So you're either going to let more people come into it and compete with you, or you're going to get better at what you do and service more people without adding to the overhead. I mean, that's just the facts in terms of volume that you have to service more homes because more people are getting air conditioned. I mean, again, we're talking back to your question earlier, five years ago, we didn't even think about targeting companies in Washington state or Minnesota about air conditioning related things. We knew they have heating, but just the climate change aspect we've seen in the last five years and the trends and the number of hundred degree days are seeing in Portland, those businesses are booming with AC. We have so many calls coming from across the North to partner with us that we didn't even, you know, didn't even reject. So as a whole, the industry is just going to keep growing. Yeah, absolutely. I was in Denver a couple of months ago. It was like 80, it was hotter in Denver than it was here in Indianapolis. And it's not like we're like hot all the time, but I was like, what in God's name is going on? I got way too many clothes on, take off the sweatshirt. But yeah, I, I think that that's, a great point as far as the industry is growing, but how do we become more efficient? How do we provide better service? How do we elevate ourselves as an industry to let customers know that we are needed and we do provide a really good service? Around that too, there's things that we're hearing from contractors that have to do with the innovation they're having to go through in different forms of equipment and different engineered solutions into houses that weren't meant to have AC. So we're getting that a lot as we're getting to the houses that have been built over the last hundred years that just simply weren't meant to have central air. How are you serving those customers? And this isn't even about us, right? It's a smart AC platform. This is just what we're hearing from contractors, what they're facing, which is real, right? Just because like I said, a growing industry in, in ways that hadn't been imagined before. Absolutely. I know we're about halfway through or so, and I want to be respectful of everyone's time, but I wanted to talk a little bit about our partnership moving forward to next year to give people a little bit of a sneak peek into what they can expect from kind of what we've put together. I'm really excited about it. I think that your guys is from, from a technology point of view is going to be super beneficial, but also just from your understanding of the industry and what you're seeing out there and giving people insights. I guess first, what prompted you to kind of partner with the podcast? And then also on the back end of that, what are you kind of hoping for listeners to get from what you guys are going to hopefully provide here in 2024? Yes, I think what we've been excited to be able to do, and it's been really a treat, is working, like you said, with some of the biggest players in the space. And the reason these players are big is because they've been innovative for the last decade, right? And so Andy and I find ourselves kind of in awe of their ability to innovate yes but also implement at the end of the day ideas are a dime a dozen it's what do you do with it and how can you handle the change management in your organization and so i think some of the conversations and the learnings that andy and i have had over the last couple of years specifically being able to have a platform to just discuss just some of the trends we're seeing and deliver some value to the industry just by voicing some of those things we want to talk about topics so if you're trying to sell replacements in the summer 90 to 120 days before that we want to have a podcast where we're interviewing maybe somebody who leads one of the most successful teams at average ticket, right? Or things of that nature. So in each one of these podcasts, we're going to try to be topical. We're going to dive very deep into that specific topic with a goal of just giving people one or two actionable insights that they can actually implement. And a lot of the things people take on take months to implement, of course, and there's some value to that, but also we just want to provide some value of things that people can implement maybe even more quickly and effectively. Certainly, you know, if you're not on a field service management platform, get on one, right? If you haven't considered technology for your memberships, do that, right? But I mean, we're going to be talking about a lot of different topics that aren't quite as specific and trying to bring some of the best minds into the space here and there 
to share what they've learned is most beneficial for their companies as well. You nailed it on the head. I think that what we've talked about is how do we provide that value? But you guys having kind of an outside, a different perspective, which is always great. We found the most value a lot of times in people that are in the day-to-day grind and can get kind of put blinders on as to, well, this is how we've always done it. This is what we got to be thinking about. But getting all those different perspectives, I think, whether it be on a podcast or in kind of a group setting is really understanding of like, hey, here's what we're seeing. And then getting the perspective of someone who's in the day-to-day of like, hey, well, yeah, I think that would work, but what about this? Or what about this? And then really kind of working through those, I think is going to be extremely beneficial to our listeners. As you said, as it's topical, it's, hey, you've got 90 days before summer hits. You've got a 90 days before kind of the shoulder season hits. What should we think about? And I think that's just going to be critical in hopefully preparing our listeners to have a great year and, and why I'm so excited about being able to partner with you guys and have tremendous respect for you both and, and what you've created and, and just your overall understanding of the industry. I think it's very rare. And the reason I wanted to partner with you guys that you get a partner that understands the industry. I remember the first time you came into town, Josh, and it was like talking to somebody that was in the industry, like, okay, you get what our problems are and your product along with just other insights is, you know, just different things to think about. Yeah, thanks. I think one of the most valuable things we can add is just we see what doesn't work. Like Andy and I will hear what a partner is going to do and be like, hey, that 70% is perfect, right? But this 30%, we've seen fail five times in the last two years, right? Well, you know, obviously data is really the biggest play for our company. But also the name of the podcast we're doing is Experience Matters, right? And so it's really about learning from the experience of others. In this case, it's our partners can learn from the experience that we have seen just with seeing what our other partners that are successful are doing or not doing. And so really, that's what we want to do. We just want to allow the experience of some of the bigger players in the space to inform some of the decision making of the medium or smaller players that are trying to get to that next level. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a good friend of ours, Cristiano. He has his event coming up in February. And I always say it's the best event going because you get the best of the best there that are talking about all the things that are either relevant now or things that we should be thinking about that are going to be relevant in the near future. And so I think that that's going to be huge. I think also, too, a piece that you touched on earlier as it relates to kind of the experience matters is, you know, I think what your product says is the customer experience matters. And in a year that, as we said at the beginning, where search volume may be lower, different things may be, we've got to really, as home service professionals, we've got to really invest in the experience that we're providing to our customers and making sure the ones that have already trusted us once, trust us again and again and again, as opposed to just relying on growth being solely from new customers who may not be there. Andy, I guess, what have you seen as it relates to that, that the contractor should be thinking about? Where where do you see some of these top players really investing in kind of the experience that they're providing to their customers as opposed to, we got to get new customers, new customers, new customers, new customers, which is something we all lose sight over. You know, it's like, oh, we got all these great memberships and we never maximize the value of it. Yeah, I think starting where you started with this topic, which is this has been a down year for many across the board. And so what I see a lot of people doing is stepping back and saying, okay, let's look at what happened, right? Like what's going on? And if you kind of look at what the likely culprit over the last several years is demand was pulled forward due to COVID. You take what would have been steady growth over multiple years and you pull it all into inside of a year and a half. Well, What happens on the other side of that? When all of your funnel works its way through quickly, it's really, really great for valuations and selling a business and all that because it looks like this will go on forever. Historically, we know that's not the truth. And so now it's full funnel optimization. It's everything from the nurturing phase, right? How do you get somebody interested in doing business with you and keep them interested all the way through the big ticket item? There's a lot more focus on keeping people from the first time you step into their house engaged with you as an individual contractor, not letting them circle back into the advertising pool because they see how expensive that has become. That is one of the absolute biggest things we focus on is how do you increase your conversion rate for the first time you step in there, make those advertising dollars matter from day one. And then how do you create value ongoing? Josh mentioned this earlier, for somebody to stay interested in you, you have to be relevant. 
when you're only there twice a year, maybe three times a year, if you've got plumbing and, and other services involved, you're just not relevant. And we know from our experience, people don't care about air conditioning. And they didn't suddenly start caring because of COVID. They just, the run times increases in your, your need for use. So it looked like they cared, but it didn't. So the fundamentals haven't changed really across the board. It's the need to get in a customer's home, provide an incentive for conversion onto some sort of a long-term plan, and then continue to provide ongoing value. And the only way you can do that effectively is technology. So it's the optimization of the whole life cycle of a customer. And what we're hearing a lot is a word of customer lifetime value, right? I don't think that was tossed around in the AC industry nearly as much as it should have been five years ago, but we hear it now. And the reason is because they know how important that is. And you can actually court a customer all the way through the full life cycle. And you can do it inexpensively when you get that big ticket, right? And you sell that 10, 15, $20,000 replacement. That's awesome. And then so many people think, well, there's nothing there for a long time. I don't want to see these people for another 10 years, but if you can hold on to them, for very little cost or even make money while you're holding on to them, that's the best thing to do, right? Homes under management, we cannot stress that enough. That's a new metric for us that we're pushing everybody to do is really evaluate that aspect of it. And cross-selling is a big part of that too, right? When you have a plumber in the house, they could be grabbing the home for HVAC and vice versa. And so obviously a lot of the larger players we work with do HVAC and plumbing and the ability for those trades to be increasing the lifetime value of the home by making sure the homeowner you know, I like to say one of the biggest values of our platform is doing a check mark in the homeowner's mind that I have a company for HVAC and plumbing and Peterman is that company. And so really you can be doing that entry in a lot of different ways. We have some really big pest players that do HVAC, that they use their pest techs to grab the home for HVAC and plumbing, right? So there's different ways of going about it. But yes, like Andy said, customer lifetime value really is in most businesses would be one of the most important metrics. And it is in this one as well. And then the ratio of that to how much it costs you to acquire that customer are probably the largest, you know, the most important ratio of the entire business. Yeah, I, I think both of you brought up some fantastic points. And I know we talked about private equity at the beginning. And I think depending on who you are, that has a really negative connotation or, you know, maybe some have had good experiences with that. But I think the one thing that I've really kind of leaned into is the fact that we can learn a lot, maybe not from an operational perspective. I think as operators, we know that piece of the business, but I think it's really their ability to leverage data and to really look at it. One of the things to your point, Josh, that we've really looked at or really leaned into is how many of our customers in a 12 month period have used more than one of our services. So we offer all three plumbing, electrical, and HVAC, but like how many HVAC customers that maybe started as HVAC have used plumbing or electrical? And then how do we monetize that with people that already trust us? They're already used to our technicians. They're already used to our process, all of this stuff. Whereas one of you pointed out, I can't remember, it may have been you, Andy, is that these people, because they lean into data from a PE perspective, I was asked by a PE guy, well, if your highest ROI is in pay-per-click, why don't you just put all your money there? Like, okay, <laughs> and lot, but yes, that does make some sense. I agree, but you can't put all your money there. <laughs> But that's what these guys are thinking. They're like, well, we can track it. This is our highest ROI. How do we dump more money? Well, the more money they dump, the higher it is to acquire a customer. So how do we take the customers that we've already acquired and really kind of lean into that? And I think that's going to be critical moving forward. As you said, Andy, that, you know, your funnel definitely got drug up. I mean, we've seen it where over the last... 2023, as opposed to 2020, 2021, 2022, as far as growth percentage, there's growth there. And it's probably more on track for what you could normally expect, but it is less than what we have in the previous three years, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. So you mentioned something earlier. I just wanted to share a metric that I think is important about when you go to the home, just because there's a membership plan, you're going, you're often wasting money. So we asked a lot of our enterprise customers, what, what is your percentage of no fee? right? Truck rolls and low fee truck rolls. It's pretty shocking, right? I was on a call the other day and I shared, I said, look, I'm not going to share who it is, but somebody told me, I actually went through the math with them on a $150 ticket or less, that was 70% of their calls. And the group on the other end of the Zoom call with me is a very big group. Everyone would know and said, wow, that's shocking. I'm curious what ours is. And his number first was right there. And he said, do you, do you know? And she said, ours is definitely higher than that. And he was like, what? What? That's a problem. <laughs> and, and it's funny, it's these are known things, 
but they're accepted things because the business is still making money. Like it's so hard to take a business that's making money and doing well and think we got to double down guys. Where are we going to take out the next uh, 130% bump on EBITDA if you're already doing well? And so anyway, just you reminded me of that when you were talking about how our PE groups have changed things is it really has highlighted that scrutiny around the data. Absolutely. I mean, it's one of those things where you can get caught in, well, this is how we've always done it. And this is, you know, what we're going to continue to do, but is there a better way to do it? And I think with your product, leaning into technology, AI, all of these things can be, you know, levers to pull to make our businesses more efficient. And at the end of the day, we're not trying to short the customer any visits or anything like that. If the majority of 70% of our calls are zero dollars, they didn't want to buy anything anyway. So why did we go out to their house? I always joke in our industry, it's like, you know, you always coach up like everything's an opportunity. If they just had their system put in eight months ago and they've only paid like four payments on their new system that they're going to be paying for for the next 10 years, that's not as good as an opportunity as someone's system that's broke. I'm sorry. We can coach it up all that we want, but it's going to be hard. So when we built out our platform, though, we, we're not trying to like reinvent the wheel. What is important about memberships is touch points, right? It's understanding like having FaceTime. And so what we try to do is we try to reinvent ways of accomplishing those same things, right? Doing a virtual visit where you record a three or four minute video showing all of the data of their HVAC systems for the last six months and saying, hey, you're all good. We'll see you in person in six months from now. Or calling attention to, hey, you didn't change your air filter last month. You know, when you get a chance, do that. And so just reinforcing the fact that there are other ways of getting those touch points with monthly reports or with live chat or with videos. And so really, we try to reinforce the fact that people have been doing it the right way for decades. It was the best way of doing it. And that is always the case until it's not, right? Or until it's not the optimal case. And so I don't think there has been anything wrong with the approach. It was the best way. You could not never go to the house and have a relationship, right? Well, now you can. Doesn't mean you should never go, but you don't have to go as much at a minimum. And if a customer doesn't want you there, you can offer them great service without ever going until they need you. And so that is just something new that hasn't been available. And during our research phase, you know, we found out what was important to people, cost, ease. And so, you know, we wanted to be able to bring those things to the table. One of the things that we're super sensitive to the fact that, like you said, you guys are great operators. We work with businesses that have been in business for a hundred years. Right? That doesn't happen if you're not a good operator and you're not running a business that's making money and serving a customer well. And so we are very sensitive to that when we come in. We're not looking to change people's processes and how you do it. We try and put as light a footprint as possible. Chad, I'm actually curious from your perspective, you guys are literally going through this whole implementation process right now. There's a fear of change, right? What's been your experience with going through the process with us? Yeah, I mean, I think that the biggest hurdle that we've had to overcome is that change. You know, there's always the second, well, what's the customer going to say? Well, what, what are they going to say? Like, well, have we asked them? Have we, you know, went down this path of like, well, maybe they like that better. I know I would like that better. Like if you're just monitoring my system, that's cool. That's one less thing I have to do on a day-to-day -day basis. I don't have to make time in my schedule to call off work and go visit somewhere or have people at the house or whatever it is. And I think that to me, that's been the biggest thing is getting everybody on board with, we've got to look at this differently. You know, I was talking to Ken Goodrich, who I know is one of the guys that you guys are rolling this out, probably may have the most units out there right now deployed, which is awesome. And so I was kind of asking him, I was like, so how should I be thinking about this? And he made a comment to me, I would pull it up on text. He made this profound statement, which was awesome. It was like, how do we become a monitoring company? How do we think about it from a monitoring perspective? You know, security systems have been out there for ever and a day. And we essentially pay the monthly fee for our security system. We get the benefit of it every day. So how do we look at it from a different perspective? Look at it from, I get we've been doing memberships since, you know, Jim Abrams came up with the idea in what, the early 90s or something like that. So what if there's a better way to do it? And so I think that's been the biggest challenge is really just that change management of getting everybody on board with, you know what? Is it going to diagnose their system and give them everything? No, that's why we have technicians that it alerts us and then we go. And to me, that's another touch point. Whereas before we had to wait for the coldest day of the year 
everybody calls. calls, Well, if we can spread that demand out by getting to people that maybe didn't know there was a problem or they kind of knew it, it was living on its last leg and we're going to hold out and then it breaks down, you know, all of those things. So I think just the change piece has been the toughest piece, especially with people that have been working in the industry for a long time. It's like, well, everybody has like what the customer's going to think. It's like, well, why don't we use the data and ask what they do think? Obviously, I'm going to run my numbers after this to find out how many zero dot, what percentage of all calls are zero or low dollar calls. Uh, I'll text you guys as what to what I find. But to me, it's that piece. It's like, well, what are we solving for here? We're not solving to repair the system with a mod, with a device. It's not what we're trying to do here. We are simply trying to provide value to the customer. And if we can provide value and also make us more efficient and provide a better service, then we win. And so getting clear on what it is we're actually trying to do with the device. I think so many people that I've talked to, it's like, well, it doesn't do this or it doesn't do that. It's like, it's not supposed to. It's just supposed to be there and provide the customer with peace of mind and provide us useful data that we can use to help the customer. Yeah, I spend most of my time focusing on the software value of our platform, not the hardware value. Obviously, we have to have the sensors to be able to give them a curated experience. But like you've heard me say a bunch of times, Chad, I think 90% of our platform is done when you've sold a membership and it's your logo in their face every time they have anything regarding HVAC or plumbing. Every time they change your filter, they have to see your logo three times to change the filter, right? Or reorder filters or whatever it is. So so yeah, l- like you said, it's mostly just a smoke detector, you know, security type thing. You don't need to know the room the fire's in. You just need to know the fire truck needs to be deployed. And then you can hit it from all angles once you're there. Well, yeah, I mean, a a smoke detector goes off sometimes. I had mine go off. People are calling me for my alarm saying, hey, the smoke detector went off. I'm like, there is no smoke detector going off in my house. Well, then should we just get rid of all the smoke detectors in our house if it doesn't work properly? No, (laughs) it's it's there for a reason. Yeah, I think at the end of this year and our participation in this series, I think we'll have done our job if we get people to at least step back and think, how can innovation, how can technology help my business? We are one part of that, but we're a growing and we're a part that's you know relevant now. But over the course of 12 months, as Josh said, our goal is to think about other technologies, other ways. Anything you can do to help your business that makes it more efficient and provides the same or better value to the customer should be looked at, right? That's what's been great. We were thrust into this three years ago, really starting to dig in and told all the ways it wouldn't work. And then here we are, you know, with some of the biggest companies in the country rolling it out because of what you said, Chad, exactly. Not because of what it doesn't do. It's because they looked at their operation and said, if it just does this, it's worth it. And there's many other things that you should look at for that, for those same reasons. Yeah, Absolutely. Well, guys, as we come up here, I think that, you know, the information you've provided today is just kind of a micro glimpse into what listeners can expect over 2024. I know I'm pumped. And since you guys will be leading a lot of the episodes, I'm really pumped to listen and learn, which is really cool. It seems like anytime I see one of our episodes, I'm like, well, shoot, I've already did the episode. I talked to it. So I think that'll be a really cool thing for me. And then obviously just to get a different perspective, I think you guys are going to provide tremendous value in being a partner with us and us with you. I guess as we wrap up here, anything that you guys want to kind of leave the listeners with as we kind of close out the episode? Just reiterating that what we're going to try to do with the podcast is just tackling, you know, going very deep on a few select topics that we think can have the most impact. And then, like you said, the name kind of lent itself to learning from the experience of some of the other bigger players in the space, not our experience, but our experience by learning from their experience and then focusing on the customer experience. I really think that what we've seen in the entire technology revolution in the Internet and in any other IoT devices or anything in the technology, the people with the best user experience win. And so we're trying to encourage our partners to think about what are the technologies that can either make your internal users, your employees better because they have a better experience and they're able to scale their abilities or from the customer perspective, how will this give Miss Jones a better experience so that she doesn't even think about going elsewhere because she has the best service offering on the market? Absolutely. Well, guys, I I can't thank you enough for spending a little time with us. I know listeners pulled some valuable insights out of this with a lot more to come here over the next year. So 
I think that your overarching theme of really this podcast, or at least what I took from it, is there's always something that we can learn. There's always something that can push our companies forward, continue to innovate, and as Josh, you said it, implement. There's a lot of great ideas out there, but until we put them in play, those ideas will never work. So as we wrap up today, again, if you get a chance, check out smartac.com. They do a tremendous job on their website of explaining what the product is. If you need more information on it, I think that's imperative. Check out the product and we will look forward to hearing from Andy and Josh here in 2024. Thanks for tuning in. If you'd like to get connected, you can find me at chadmpeterman.com. To see what our team's up to, you can visit petermanbros.com. As always, keep growing out there.